This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On February 26, 2014, the Security Studies Committee presented Professor Stuart Hendon, QC, of the Faculty of Law of the University of Ottawa. Professor Hendon has just concluded an assignment to Kabul, where he was advising and mentoring the Ministry of Justice of Afghanistan and its legal staff. What a pleasure to be here. Absolutely, what a pleasure to be here. You have no idea what it's like to be able to get out of a car, to walk in a street, uh, to sleep with both eyes closed, uh, not to listen to see, to hear the helos coming over your room. Uh, the day that I came out, uh, in fact, well, an hour or so before I came out, there was an explosion probably two or three hundred meters from uh, our compound. I, I, I felt the blast in my room. An ANA, an Afghan National Army bus, was hit. I saw the smoke coming up. This is the day-to-day existence in Afghanistan, but more about that. Firstly, Chris, thank you so much for letting me be here. It's, it's, uh, it's both a pleasure and a distinction. Um, and thank you all for coming. Let me for the moment please take a moment and acknowledge some very, very special people. Uh, my wife, Mally, my son, Brian, uh, David and Arlene, my brother and uh, sister-in-law, uh, who are my constant support in Afghanistan. Every day, uh, I was on Skype twice a day, but even notwithstanding the nine and a half hour time difference. And but for those conversations, I'm not sure that I would have kept the modicum of sanity that I did. Uh, it's a completely different environment to live and work in. And I'd also like to recognize someone else in the room, uh, James Reese. Uh, Jimmy, stand up for a second, please. James was deployed at the same time that I was there. We were on two different projects. James was uh, at Camp Eggers working to try, and I use the word try very generously, to reconstruct the or construct the reserve force for the ANA, the Afghan National Army. Uh, and please, as, as you wish to ask questions to me, and of course I'll avoid answering them, as lawyers always do, but uh, ask Jim as well, because he'll give you a slightly different perspective. Uh, the, I, I suppose the one difference when, when Jim and I would see each other is he wore his Glock all the time, and I only had mine under my pillow at night. So, Afghanistan. I'm not going to paint a good picture of it, because with the greatest of respect, I don't think there is a good picture to be painted. If one looks at the most recent failed state index, Afghan is number seven on that list. If one looks at the corruption state index, Afghan is third on that list. That is third from the bottom. There are only two states more corrupt than Afghanistan. For those of us that were working in the justice sector, BBC did a poll about a month before I came out. And the poll that they did uh, was really amongst those that had some education and tended to be in the populated areas. The BBC Justice Sector poll found that only about 50% had any faith, not absolute faith, but any faith in the justice system that I was trying to work in. The government control of Afghanistan, and some may differ, but it was my opinion after watching and, and dealing with government officials, that uh, on a good day, the government of Afghanistan controlled perhaps 25 to 30 percent of the geography and the same amount of population. That dovetails perfectly with the fact that Afghanistan was, and still is, unfortunately, a failed state. Last Friday, for those of you who may have been following the media, the Afghan Minister of Defense was in Australia, and his comment to his counterpart in Australia was that Afghan is in, and this is a direct quote, is in a state of war. What does that say about the last 13 years where blood and money has been spent 
without a substantial measure of success. There have been pockets of success. But one of the things that struck me, almost from the time I got there, was the fact that the Afghans will complain, and, and, and rightly so, complain about the failures of their system, but could not take ownership for it. And that seems to me to be the fundamental problem, particularly when I was working in the justice sector. To put another thing in context, somewhere in the area of 80% of the operating budget of Afghanistan comes in from outside sources, from aid or, or, or outright grants. But 65% of government expenditures have to go for security. So what's left? Afghanistan still is, according to the UN Office on Drug and Crime, is still the major producer slash exporter of opium. Approximately 80% of the world's opium still comes out of Afghanistan. When you put all of those things together, those of us who have to work in a justice system, we're facing barriers that it's almost impossible to measure. And there are times that it, it became, and I don't like to use the term, an exercise in futility, but you really would, when we would go out in the morning to do our training, um, particularly the group that I was involved in, you sometimes came back with a sense of, what was I able to accomplish? And you would find small pockets, one or two people, you could see a light come on. But for the rest, it just wasn't there. And why isn't it there in a justice system in Afghanistan? Because in Afghanistan, there are three justice systems competing with each other. There is Sharia law, there is customary law, and then there is what I was working in called the constitutional law system. It's regrettable, and, and, and I say this, uh, I, I think it's as, almost as a matter of failure, but the Sharia law system in the parts of the country where the Taliban hold sway, the Sharia law system is by far the fastest and most equitable and predictable. Customary law in parts of Afghanistan are geared more to consensus and are dealt with at the tribal level, at the clan level, even you know, within families. But as a functioning justice system, the Sharia one was one that was in its own way predictable, and more importantly, was not corruptible. Let me then come into the issue of corruption of judges. And let me then sort of segue into the problem within the justice sector. I would spend two days a week, give or take, uh, instructing at the National Police College in Afghanistan. And the National Police College, like so many other government buildings, is simply an armed fort. When we would go in, it would be a series of steel barriers. The car was checked from time to time. You know, we would go out, the dog would go through, you know, sniffing, uh, sniffing the car. We, were always, we would always have to show our identification at least twice. Uh, and then we would actually go into a, in, into a classroom setting. 25% of the new recruits that would come into the uh, ANP, the Afghan National Police, 25% of them were functionally illiterate in their own language. So for those of us that were trying to teach law, particularly from a constitutional law, from a written series of codes, it was almost impossible. Because we were, in some cases, actually having to have teachers teaching them how to read and write at the same time we were trying to teach even the most fundamental basics of law. Compounding that is a legal system that has as its basis that every law in Afghanistan must conform with Islam. We function in a society 
where there's a separation of church and state. There, there is no separation. That every law that is promulgated must be consistent with Islam. But what then becomes very difficult is that different individuals will have their own version and application of what the Quran would, would say. The concept of constitutional law, written law as we would understand it, is still, in the current context, still new in Afghanistan. A number of the judges and prosecutors that I was trying to train have had, when I say I, our, our group was trying to train, had no training whatsoever in codified law as such, the law that had come from the Constitution. Their training was the application of Sharia law. To try and move that mindset, to try and move that mindset into an idea that we have to apply law that is codified was, and I use the term, a Herculean challenge, and in many, many cases, we failed. We absolutely failed. The, the significance then, and, and let me give you just, just a, a, funny, a funny anecdote. One of the judges I was trying to train, uh, in the class I was training, uh, when we were dealing with the concept of the application of codified law, would interrupt constantly saying, Sharia law provides this, and if it isn't in Islam, uh, and if it doesn't come from Islam, then it is worthless. Now, in fairness, this was the, uh, the preoccupation of one judge in a classroom, but this one judge was trying to, in essence, usurp our position as teachers slash trainers and really take us back to reverting uh, to, to the concept that Sharia should be the operative law and everything else really didn't matter. And this judge was, uh, and I use the term dynamic, but overbearing uh, to a point. Well, in fact, yeah, completely overbearing. And I must tell you, I, as my brother and my son and my, my, my dear wife will say, um, a lot of my clothes have Velcro along the back of them because it takes a lot of work to keep me from coming off the wall. And I spent a lot of time you know, being bounced off the wall. So I went to this chap and who clearly had absolute disdain for me and anyone from the West. And I took a look at him, talked to him, and I said, you know, and the other thing is that there are very few landlines in Afghanistan. Most everything is cell phones. So this chap had a cell phone on his desk, and I went to, to him, and I said, uh, looked at, at the cell phone, and I said, uh, was this made by, by someone uh, who uh, uh, follows the Quran in Afghanistan? And he, I said, it looks like a Blackberry to me. And he didn't say anything. Uh, and I said, uh, can I see your watch for a second? So I, he objected. So I looked at the watch and I said, this isn't made in Afghanistan. It can't be any good. And then I said, I looked at him and I said, tell me, have you been to Hajj? And he said, of course, he's very proud of it. I said, how did you get there? Did you walk? He said, no, I took an aircraft. I flew. I said, was that aircraft made by someone who's a Muslim from Afghanistan? He said, looked at me and insulted, no, of course. I said, so tell me then, if these three things weren't made in Afghanistan and weren't done by, uh, by, by Muslims in Afghanistan, how can they be any good? And he looked at me with just... with. It had gone from disdain to hatred. But that's fine. That's the reality of the environment that we have to work in. <clears throat> the treatment of women in Afghanistan. I use the term horrendous. That does not come close. Women in parts of Afghanistan are treated, and I see Jimmy shaking his head, I see the former member of parliament shaking her head. We know they are treated as chattels that are bought and sold, that rights of women are trampled, that where there is abuse and violence toward women, the police simply do nothing. If a woman 
leaves her home to marry someone that the family doesn't approve of. A complaint is made. The girl is arrested and is put in custody in a shelter, which is another word for a jail. And how is the woman released? And I tell you this because this was from one of my students. He had gone and showed the jail commander the law that says this is illegal. The jail commander just simply said, go away. The defense counsel had to go to the girl's family and bring the family to the jail to show and have the father say, we forgive her. Well, again, for those of us that work in the rule of law, it makes no sense. Lawyers and judges that are supposed to understand how law is brought into their system have no fundamental training in what we consider the most basic of things, critical thinking. When we look at something, we say, why, why not? There, it's simply an acceptance. So that when you ask someone, why have you taken this decision? Why did you do this? The answer is, this is Afghanistan. You can point to someone uh, I'll give you a, a very clear example. I was doing a training session with a prosecutor who had allowed an individual to be kept in custody past the mandatory confinement for investigation period. And when I was going through his file with him, I showed him that he had gone well past the expiration date. My student who I had spent at that point in time about, and a, a prosecutor, that I'd spent about three months working with almost on a daily basis, started arguing with me that the prosecutor was right, that it was okay in his mind to simply ignore the limitation period. And when I looked at him and we're driving back in our car, and I said, how can you do this? We are here teaching rule of law. His answer to me was, <clears throat> well, this is Afghanistan. I said, but you're dealing with the fundamental rights of an accused. And he said, hey, it doesn't matter. Well, yes, it does matter. It does matter. I've been training a judge for about three months. And I went to, I've been asked to go and review a couple of files with him. And very well turned out man, reasonably articulate, in fact, fairly articulate. And uh, he was reviewing with me uh, a murder case. And in this case, at best, the evidence was entirely circumstantial, at, at very best. The accused had been held in custody for 18 months. This judge, who was the trial judge, had agreed that there was precious little evidence that would allow this case to proceed to trial. The uh, maximum amount, doing all of the investigation timings and delays, would have been roughly eight months that he could have been kept in custody. So he had been in custody for 18 months. So I queried the judge, uh, why is he still in custody for, the, for 18 months? And I said, what have you done to have him released? He's, this is under your authority. And he said, well, I wrote a letter to the prosecutor. And I said, and what has happened? He said, well, the prosecutor didn't get back to me. I said, well, what have you done vis-a-vis -vis the jail where he's being kept in custody? And he said, well, I'd written a letter to the jail commander to tell him to be released. But he hasn't been released. So I said, what did you do? And he looked at me and said, what do you mean? What did I do? And we're going back and forth through our interpreters. I said, what have you done in this remaining 10-month period? And he sort of looked at me and said, well, nothing. So I turned it around. I said, how would you react if you had been kept in custody this amount of time? And his reaction to me, and this is an absolute quote direct from my, my interpreter, was, oh, it would be unfortunate. Well, <laughs> okay. 
to a degree, that sort of sums it up. When you look at uh, a court file there, very few, now, the constitutional law provides that anyone who comes into a court there charged with a criminal offense is much like our system, as we use the expression, uh, wearing the cloak of innocence. Don't believe it over there. The judges will rely on what a prosecutor tells them. In many, many cases, cases are decided without actual evidence being given. Rather, the prosecutor will talk to the judge, and the judge will say, that is sufficient for me to make a conviction. When you, there are no transcripts kept of any cases. So if a case were to go to appeal, what would the lawyer who is doing the appeal look for to uh, draw to an appeal court? This is what happened at trial. There is no transcript. There is no record kept of cases. So if someone wants to research a case at the appeal court level or from any of the other primary courts, there is no central record. If you know perhaps where a case has taken place, and maybe you know someone who can go through and manually sort files, uh, maybe you can find it. But you will not find uh, a transcript or any of the evidence, either physical or, or, or given. There are no witness lists kept as to who appeared at a trial. What there is is a note from the, judge, the trial judge on the file, this was my decision and why. Trial judges, and, and we see this in, in cases here, a judge will uh, often assess the credibility of a witness. Am I going to believe this witness or not? What are the fundamentals, uh, what is one of the main fundamentals that a judge in Afghanistan will look at to determine someone's credibility? Does this individual go to mosque? That's the prime criteria. Well, let me put it another way. How many thieves go to trial and they can have someone come and say, oh, but he goes to mosque, therefore he must be believed, therefore he must be credible. Corruption cases. <coughs> and I, I, I digress a bit. A judge in Afghanistan, the average salary for a judge is $80 a month. Let me repeat that. $80 a month, which is what? Uh, a year. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can't live on that. You can't. So, two or three things happen. One, it begs corruption, and judges will, senior judges, will buy their positions from a local governor. But in essence, you don't really buy your position, do you? You rent it because you've had to pay to get that position. Then you have to earn enough to both pay for what you've done to get the position, plus to live on. And just in case someone outbids you for the rental for the next spasm, you have to start putting money away. Prosecutors are bribed. Police are bribed. The best example of police being bribed on a daily basis are the traffic police. The, and, and the reason there are so many traffic police is firstly, uh, and I use Kabul, Kabul as the example, uh, driving in Kabul is like driving uh, bumper cars on ice. Fair description. <laughs> and uh, if you are stopped in, uh, for any sort of traffic offense, or just simply stopped, period, you're not given, as we are here, a ticket of any sort, your car is impounded. And to get a car back out of impound, six months maybe, on a fast track. So what do you do? You bribe the traffic cop. This is how they earn their income. The police that walk or patrol uh, receive minimal salary, but for those that are in particular districts, uh, in Chicago it used to be called protection. Uh, it's still alive and well in Kabul. The standard police vehicle that we see there all the time 
is uh, a green Ford pickup truck with usually four seats in the back and a machine gun mount on the top. Sometimes it has a 30 caliber, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but more often than not, it's actually taking family members around. Why are they taking family members around? Because there are very few gas stations in Kabul, but if you have a police vehicle, you have unlimited supply of gas. So therefore, it becomes your family car. The issue of poverty, and this is what struck me uh, virtually every day when I was there, the issue of poverty. Whenever we would get, and uh, we couldn't walk, I couldn't walk on a street more than 15 or 20 feet uh, from wherever I got out of our, our, our armored car, our heavy car, to whatever building I was going into, the maximum amount was 15 or 20 feet. But as soon as you opened the door, there were people there. The worst, the, the, no, not the worst, the most difficult scenario was uh, a woman who would come clad in a burqa, poking at you, trying to force you against a wall, and always with a hand of Mr., Mr., Mr. Now, in the environment, one of the first things we had that we were briefed on is you cannot touch a woman in Afghanistan. You can't. So if you reach out to push the woman away, the screaming starts. But it was compounded. And this is what, when I first came to grips with it, uh, it bothered me. And quite frankly, I still can't get, get past it. A lot of the women have, they carry infants in their arms. And the infants are always sleeping. I hadn't been there for two months or so. And I realized why, I was told why, the children were always sleeping. The, the infants were not theirs. They're rented from brokers. And these children are doped up on opium. The infants are doped up on opium. So they're sleeping for four or five hours while they're in the woman's arms. It's designed to get pity from those of us that, uh, that, that the money's being sought from. But then what happens is at the end of the day, or the end of the time, the infant is given back to the, the broker, renter, dope dealer. Some of the money that, that she has gotten is, is shared. But then what happens? At the end uh, of a one or two or three year cycle, whatever it may be, that child is a drug addict. And it simply is uncontrollable. Begging is illegal in Kabul, but it's a fact of life. I'm talking too much. Let me give you a couple of anecdotes of, of things that, and, and, and this is the one that, that I really get a kick out of. The uh, police checks in Afghanistan and army checks are uh, everywhere. And I was coming back, I guess a, a month or two, probably about a month before I came out. And uh, I was sitting beside our, my, my driver. My interpreter was in the back. And my briefcase that had my ID tag on it uh, was in the back of the car. The, 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 so the driver had the identification uh, plaque for our car. And he had his tag. And the uh, interpreter was wearing his ID tag. The chap came around, put the Kalashnikov in my face, and sort of said, you know, uh, ID, ID. So I gave him the best ID I had, and it worked. This is an American Express Costco card that had my picture on it. <laughs> <laughs> they say anytime you have a problem, call American Express. It worked. Wave through. The one of my. Uh, one of the chaps that had been through one of the courses that I was teaching, I went, uh, and he was a prosecutor. Uh, I get a, a funny anecdote. In his office, and it, one of the things that, that, that strikes you about Afghanistan is the individuals are, it, it probably is the most hospitable culture I have ever been exposed to. Whenever you go into, in, into any office, the first thing that is, is offered is chai tea and sweets. It's a given. This particular office we went into, um, the uh, uh, building was uh, a little ramshackle. There were four or five chaps in, in this one prosecutor's office. And of course, would you like tea? And you can't say no, you have to accept. So I said, yes, please. So in every office or every floor has a tea boy. 
And this particular chapter, very short, uh, came, and so he was told to bring me tea. So he went and went to one of the other tables where there was a teacup someone was using. He took the teacup, emptied it on the floor, and then filled the tea and gave it to me. You can't say no. No. It, but, but this particular prosecutor was, I use the term, a real piece of work. Um, I had said to him, you know, from the course that we taught him, it had been, I guess it was a two-week course. I said, tell me, you know, what, what did you learn from the course? What stands out more than anything else from the course? And he said, oh, I learned that we can't torture people to get confessions. All right, you know, we've, we've done something well. And I said, how long have you been a prosecutor? And he said, nine years. I said, so let me see if I understand this. For the first eight and a half years, it was perfectly all right to torture people to get confessions, but now that you know better, you won't do it. And he sort of looked with this, how can you ask such a stupid question? Of course I'm not going to do it anymore. Which then brings us back to how they get confessions. Uh, remember that a substantial portion of the population are illiterate, are functionally illiterate. A police file and a prosecutor's file will have a confession and very rarely a signature of the person who's making the confession, but always the thumbprint. That's fine. So this prosecutor was showing me that he had done just a superb job uh, when he received the file that there was a confession on it. I said, good. I said, uh, the accused, is he literate or illiterate? He said, oh, he couldn't read or write. I said, well, how good is his confession? He said, well, his, his thumbprint is on it. I said, if he couldn't read or write, if he couldn't read or write, what value is the confession? Because he has no idea what he signed. Or oh, the police officer would have told him what he was signing. And you stop to think about it. We come back then to critical thinking. It's not there. It's not there. The failure of so many of the organizations, and I will be very careful here. <coughs> there is pressure, incredible pressure, on organizations working in Afghanistan to deliver form over substance, to show that so many people have come through a system and they have been trained because this is what the numbers show. But in fact, if you peel back the onion, these people may have been at a course and may have been sitting in a chair, but have they been trained? Have standards been met? And the answer to that is, I don't think so. Uh, I, I really don't. Um, the, the concept of mentoring is absolutely foreign in that, uh, in that uh, culture. When I would start a class, uh, I would start with by saying, we're going to go around the classroom, and I want to see who, yeah, again, through my interpreter, I want, you know, everyone will introduce themselves. And again, one situation where a judge stood up and said, I will introduce myself first. And I said, no, you're sitting in the corner. I'm going to work around. And he said, no, I'm a senior judge. I will talk first. And I said, no, I'm the professor. I'll talk first. And I said, I'm going to walk around the class. Of course, he was, was incensed. This particular chap, and it, 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 his was not an unusual instance, um, when I would try and engage women in the class, and they were by far the, the absolute minority of the class, that I would have sometimes a 25 or 30 plus, I was fortunate if I had four or five women. Uh, if I would be engaging a female, a number of the, the old line prosecutors and judges would interrupt to say, don't listen to her, this is what I'm telling you. And for our Western culture, I came back and said, no, no, just a second. I'm talking to her, and I want to hear what she has to think. I'll hear from you later. And we would actually get into an argument as to who was going to be listened to and why. So, what did I do in Afghanistan? The last week 
10 days I was there, I was asked uh, by uh, the, the USA program to judge a moot court uh, competition for all of the law schools in Afghanistan where they would select a winning team to treat, to compete in the uh, international moot court in Washington in April. Um, these kids struggled. A number of them, their first language was, was not English, and they had been preparing for this competition for a year. And they had rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. The, uh, and I, I was fortunate enough to be one of the judges for the final competition, in which there were two teams, a team two males and two females. The uh, dedication that both of these two teams had was absolutely phenomenal. And every time, uh, when I was coming back, every time I started to think, you know, this place is an absolute waste of oxygen, I think about these four kids and how they were struggling. And you know, that may be the future of this country. If they are not uh, sucked into the, the abyss uh, that surrounds all of the problems in that culture, maybe, maybe, there's an opportunity. Now you know everything I know about everything. So, now do you remember the question I gave you to ask? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I have two things I want to uh, one is a question and one is a statement. And the statement, first and foremost, is um, I'm glad our little uh, our little safety blanket arrived home. Um, my brother and I have something very special to share. Secondly, based on what you've said, and I understand how you ended it, but my comment is, when does Western society say enough? Oh, that's for greater minds than mine. Uh, my sense is that my sense is that there is a real state of exhaustion and exasperation with uh, what's happening in Afghanistan. And, and Jimmy, you, you're closer to this than, than I am because you were training also uh, on the military side. But my sense is that when you put all the levels of things <coughs> that uh, are almost insurmountable unless and until, quote, the average Afghan starts to take responsibility and ownership for their own issues. There's nothing that we're going to be able to do from the outside that's going to help them. And the problem, too, is that failure to take, failure to take ownership is throughout the entire system. Uh, so that when we hear that the government of Germany donated a huge amount of medical supplies and medical equipment. And it functioned well for the first four or five months. But then when repairs and parts came required, the Afghans weren't equipped to do it. So then it became the Germans' problem because, you see, this thing wasn't working properly. Not how can we be trained to repair it ourselves, but you see, what you gave us now isn't working, so it's your fault. The present position, in my view, the present position of President Karzai that the failure of the West to bring peace in Afghanistan uh, is one of the prime causes that he won't sign the bilateral security agreement with the United States and then put the ripple effect onto NATO is, in, in my view, an abrogation of his responsibility to have taken ownership for his own failings and consequently the failings of his government. It is not the West who has to bring peace to his country. It is he who has to bring peace to his country with the assistance of others. But if opium is the kingpin and corruption is the norm, how is that going to happen? Greater minds than I will answer that question, David. Sir, is there anything in Islam you admire? Yes, yes. 
the, the proper interpretation, and, and let me come back to something very funny. For the first two months that I was there, uh, I would only use two or three interpreters from, from our pool. And one of them was bound to determine for the first two months that he was going to convert me to Islam. Um, I have to tell you it didn't work. I also have to tell you that uh, on a number of occasions there were six uh, kosher delicatessens that opened in Afghanistan. They opened and closed within 15 minutes uh, of each other, and there were more people at the closing than the opening. Um, a number of the people that I worked with I regard as dear, trusted friends. Um, properly construed, Islam is a religion of peace. One of the fundamentals of Islam, it, one of the fundamental tenets, is that uh, for Muslims, Christians and Jews are their brothers. Now that has been, that has been completely distorted. Um, so, if one looks purely at the religion, there should be no, we, we, we have to respect different religions. It's how the religions have been hijacked that's the issue. Uh, I, I, I will tell you this. One of my dearest friends there is a police colonel. Uh, and he and I would go out probably two or three times a week on different, different sessions. Uh, he was my adopted son in, in Afghanistan. You know, a small man of about 6'3", uh, 280 pounds. Um, and when he would be on Skype, he would talk to his adopted mother in Canada. Um, the genuine affection and deep greeting that I got from him every morning is something I have to tell you that I will cherish, period. Uh, when we would go out, when, when we would go out, he would not let me walk through a door first. He had to know what was on the other side of that door. He knew I wasn't a Muslim. I was his brother. But that speaks to his character as opposed to the real question. No, I don't think so. Because uh, he would also pray five times a day. But that's his character. The question was the religion itself. The religion itself is a religion of peace. It is. I, I agree, but um, is there any specific characteristics of the religion that you find? Yeah. Oh, the warmth and generosity. The, w one of the prime tenets of, of Islam is charity. Is charity and sharing. And I found that regularly. Regularly. Because an interesting question would be, why not try to indoctrine part of Sharia law and looking at some of the positive aspects, obviously, you know, the way they treat women, obviously not a positive, but perhaps look at using part of Sharia law instead of just a westernized, you know, case law. Well, it, it, is, it isn't so much Brian that. It's a question that uh, Sharia law is... There are tenets of Sharia law that are fine, but you can't sort of separate. So for example, under Sharia, adultery is a capital offense. Now, for those of us in the West, uh, that would be impossible. Uh, apostasy, that is, you know, trying to convert someone to another religion, is a capital offense. So there are parts of, if, if you take a look at some of the fundamentals of Sharia, they're totally inconsistent with what we say are our fundamentals of law. And one of the difficulties, again, in, in a country like Afghanistan is the separation of church and state. So that in the, the fundamental in Afghanistan is that no law can be promulgated unless if, if it is in any way inconsistent with uh, the tenets of, of, of Sharia. And that's, for those of us that work in a constitutional or written uh, system where there are appeals and, and different factors, then, again, it, it's, it's inconsistent. And yet, theft is against Sharia, murder is against Sharia. So, but they have to be codified, sir. Malaysia has a dual system. They have a Sharia courts, and they have a mirrored courts, and they have systems of appeals. They have some very, very learned judges uh, at all levels. So, uh, I'm, uh, it can work. Oh, it can, but not in, not in that type of context, because one of the things that is missing 
in Afghanistan is the concept of critical thinking. In order for a judicial system to work, you have to be able to think through it and ask questions of it, not to accept blindly. Does that, you see where I'm going with that? It, uh, but back to what you say, it, it's not Sharia law, it's the way that Sharia law is in, mm -hmm. implemented in each of the different regions, because each of the regions in Afghanistan implements it differently and depends whether they're under government control. You can't just slam it all or say it's all great. Oh no, in fact, it's interesting because the parts of the country where Sharia works, where the Taliban actually have some sway, uh, the Sharia courts are by far accepted and trusted, far more than the, the constitutional law courts. Um, Stu, it might be uh, a contribution to this discussion um, to just point out to everyone who might not know that as sectarian as Christianity is, maybe it has recognized hierarchies, which Islam by and large doesn't. So you've got nobody at the top who can say this is Sharia, as the Vatican might do in a parallel case. There are Presbyterians here, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, of course, as the Council of Presbyters might yeah, say. And then, of course, there's my tribe as well. We've yeah, 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 that's the 13th. Yeah, there have there been, there been a decade and, uh, and a bit of Western advisors and experts and uh, NATO and ISAF officials and uh, government people and EU uh, bodies working to try to bring uh, judicial and legal norms uh, and policing norms and so on to Afghanistan. Um, and I've, I've heard a lot of things like what you've said from, from people coming back. Do you get a sense that in some ways it may be uh, crystallizing the things that you're seeing or, or, or freezing people in this system by... Uh, like the encounter with the gentleman with the phones and so on, where you're, you're setting up in a small way a system where there is the Western imposed vision of how to do things, and then there's the Afghan vision. Are we, in repeatedly driving this home, helping draw people out and bring them into an understanding of this way of doing things, or are we, are we enforcing a dividing line where people become more and more stuck in their ways because to uh, to adopt the sort of judicial norms that we know know would be capitulation to a Western occupier. That is a very challenging question. Uh, the it, it's interesting because those that have been exposed, uh, those that have been exposed, and can grasp, for example, again, what I spent a lot of time on was critical thinking. The, the ability to ask a question and sort of why, why not. Um, they would be willing to, what's the expression, I'm just, almost experiment with the expansion. But the other problem is that the country, and when I say the country, uh, the people that I was training were earning a salary from, uh, it was actually funded by U.S. state, so that those that, that I was funding, or those that I was training, both in my core group as well as in larger classrooms, were getting either a salary or a per diem for being there. And the problem then is that when they would go back out into a society where the norms were completely different. And remember, I don't know if you, if, if you remember this, remember the, the, the old story that was, was told about uh, the uh, uh, assembly line at Chrysler, that it didn't matter uh, what was done, uh, it was the union on the line that, uh, that happened, or uh, we, we sometimes do it, even with our police training here, we'll send people into a police college, and then after, a way, after they finish their course, they go back out into whatever the attachments they were, and the norm is what they have to conform to. Well, we see the same thing there, only on a much larger scale. And the problem then with that is to find that low common denominator. So when you put in, in into effect uh, a country that is poverty-stricken, 
that because of the insecurity situation in the areas that are secure, and Kabul for is, you know, and Jimmy, we, we've seen the increase in the population in Kabul uh, exponentially uh, because insecurity outside, people come into the city, uh, and when they're coming in, they're bringing in their outside values, which again complicates the mix. Um, there's no easy answer. I wish there was. Uh, I sometimes think that the time I spent, I don't know. Please. I do thank you, sir, for your very frank description of what went on, avoiding the self-aggrandizement, which is common to our society, that we're doing a great job there. I can recall five or six years ago at the military institute where everybody was gung-ho, let's get in there, let's get back in the game. I appreciate what you said about this country. How does that apply to the other countries? Because we're now mixed up in at least four or five major areas where the white man's burden says we should get in there and help them. Now I can recall in my 25 or 30 years there before the Russians took over, it was a quiet country. Sure, there were wars, but that was part of normal business. You drove up through the Khyber Pass, nobody ever bothered you. Things were reasonable. What is going to happen now with the fact that <coughs> Afghanistan is a mine? Physical resources there are fantastic. The Chinese have already moved in to a major copper area. The Indians have moved in building highways. Will the impact, will the impact of, of imperialism, capital imperialism, change the country? Will that be sufficient to train these people to do things in a different way when all the foreign workers get in there, get in there and show how successful they can be in mining and producing raw materials in the country. What is your experience with that? Inshallah, that would happen. Inshallah, see. <laughs> but uh, the answer is, uh, I don't share your optimism. I, I really don't. Because the, the, the problem too is, we, and we've seen this uh, in the last several months when sort of mining concessions have been granted, uh, even the granting of the mining concessions have been corrupted. Uh, so that uh, illegal mining, even by those that are coming in to, quote, do it, uh, has been, uh, has been the, uh, uh, the commonplace. It's not uncommon for permission to be given to mine or develop things. That's part of the American history. That was part of the... Uh, business that went along, you paid a certain amount, you built a railway, and that built America. Is there any possibility that can work in Afghanistan? Possible, but not likely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stir, you mentioned uh, law schools in Afghanistan. Um, can you flesh that out a little bit? Because what I'm hearing is basically, you don't get the young people when they're 13, 14, 16, 17, start to educate them. What type of law school student do you get and what type of law school is trying to educate them? The, well, at, at, at Kabul University, and it's not, and, and there are others across the country, there are two law faculties. There is the Sharia law faculty and the common law faculty. And in many cases, there is no interchange or interplay between them. Um, the, when I went on a, on a number of occasions to meet with the dean uh, of the, the, fac the law faculty at Kabul University, and again, and this is only a personal anecdote, I said, you know, can I look at your curriculum because I want to see what your curriculum is and I want to see if there are any gaps for the people that I'm teaching. And his immediate was, why are you here to spy on me? <laughs> and it, uh, it, no matter what I said, I was a Westerner. Uh, I was there to try and tell him what he should or shouldn't be doing, rather than, I'm trying to say, look, if I can see what you're doing, then maybe I can plug some gaps into what I'm teaching. But no, I was a spy, and who had sent me, and what were they looking for? Uh, and, and that that's not uncommon. 
the one anecdote that, that I should have shared at the beginning, and we talked a little bit about, well, I, I, I talked about too much about graft and corruption. I had been, I was doing my first round of um, uh, meetings of people that I would have to be dealing with on, on a regular basis. I think, Jimmy, I shared this with you. Um, uh, my first round of courtesy calls. I'd been there probably two weeks. And I was taken into the Kabul governor's compound where the prosecutor's office was. And remember, the prosecutor's office is this building that is condemned beyond description. And up on the, uh, went into the prosecutor's office, and I could count the springs on the chair at the, the Chesterfield I was sitting on because they were all coming into my rear end. And uh, after the usual pleasantries of you know, tea and sweets, and how well, wonderful the work that, that IDLO is doing there. Uh, then came the, and I should also tell you this man was impeccably dressed, wearing a perfectly tailored suit, and wearing the watch, the last letter did, did not, it ended in X, and it wasn't time X. He had, without a blush of anything, the absolute temerity to say, would I give him a thousand dollars so he could buy a new desk? Total stranger. But I was there from the West. Would I give him a thousand dollars for a new desk? And I said, "Well, I don't. No, I don't do that. I'm just here to teach. I'm just, you know, a simple teacher." Then came the second hook. Well, you must know somebody who can do that for me. And I said, "I'm only here." And they, of course, if you then say, "Let me look and see if I can find someone," you've bought into the problem. Yep. All of a sudden, you've now promised him a thousand dollars, not the new desk. I was in a prosecutor's office. And they were complaining about any number of things. But this prosecutor said, uh, you know, I said, you know, I, I want to come back and follow up on some of your files. And he said, yes, please come back. But when you come back, would you bring me a computer? I said, why do you need a computer? He said, well, I need it for my work. I said, but what part of your work? I said, none of your cases are in any database. <clears throat> oh, but I want a computer. I said, but what do you need it for? What what purpose is it? What part of your system is computerized? He said, well, nothing's computerized, but you should bring me a computer. To listen from the Vivaldi's view and also maybe add um, oh, please. perspective. First of all, thank you for being in Afghanistan. Thank you for serving. Thank you for doing all this. This means a lot to us. Like I have been one of the women who have lived my life, most of my life in Afghanistan, and experienced lots of challenges even though being a member of parliament in Afghanistan. And I have received lots of clients and people who had suffered from the uh, problems that our system of governance has, and as well as the judiciary system. So um, I don't want you to get the impression that what you do is useless, or it doesn't make any sense or difference in our life. These might look like very small steps that we are all taking, but it means a lot to the people who are suffering from the unhealthy system in place in Afghanistan. If you train one judge, that judge can change the life of thousands or hundreds of citizens of that city and that country. So if, in long term, I'm sure that we can see the effect. But the whole idea, I think, should be changing the system or bringing a healthy system in place rather than training individuals. These individuals will retire and then for, or for many reasons they will, might stop working. So what will happen then? We lose resources and the capacities that we have there. As a member of parliament who have been involved in reviewing and amending laws in favor of women, human rights, and children in the parliament of Afghanistan, I see, as you said, um, the Sharia law and the misinterpretation of Islam and Sharia law as the first problem in the judiciary system of Afghanistan and also legislation uh, system of Afghanistan. And this is all in the hands of authorities, in the hands of the leadership of the country, and has nothing to do with judges only. So it's very important to keep that link and make sure that where it's coming from, like what are the roots that are creating problems on the ground when it comes to uh, justice system. Um, and literacy, literacy or illiteracy, most of the people who do not know about their own religion, when they hear a misinterpretation, or something which is not true and it, it has not its roots in Islam, they just accept it 
without knowing that either if this is true or not. So what we are trying to do is that bring up those good examples of Sharia who can help the women's rights, for example, advocating for women's rights, and ignore those parts or customize those parts which are not in favor of humanity and, and women's rights in Afghanistan. And this is the only way that we can develop this customization of the laws and like constitution law in Afghanistan. If we want to neglect and discredit the Sharia law, we do not have the room to discuss about constitution law at all in the parliament of Afghanistan. Forget about the communities. So it has its own good values and its challenges. We find a way how to deal with it step by step as the younger generation of Afghanistan, as younger legislators, as younger judges in place. But I think the main and the major challenge in Afghanistan is bad governance, which has its roots and links with corruption and many other things. How can you speak of peace in a country which there is no rule of law? So this is number one thing that we have to address, and this has been neglect neglected. Most of our budget is going to security rather than, for example, having a justice system in place. So there was not a balance in Afghanistan from the beginning. So I appreciate what you have done in Afghanistan, and I wish you continue for many more years to come, not only in Afghanistan, but also in other parts of the world. So like Egypt is experiencing what we have experienced 10, 10 years ago, right now. So I'm sure that your experience can make a huge difference in the life of the ordinary citizens of Afghanistan, especially the women of that country and the children of that country. So thank you for your presentation and all the information that you have given. Oh, it was my great, great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes today's webcast. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for listening. You can keep up with coming events at the RCMI by visiting our website at www.rcmi.org. We hope you'll tune in again, and we hope to see you in person at coming events. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>